not taking too much time. So anyway, my name is Eric Schlepfer. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as TubeTime. I like to cut things in half, but I also like to do a lot of reverse engineering and retrocomputing stuff. And so this is kind of an interesting intersection of retrocomputing and reverse engineering. So you might be wondering about the Sound Blaster card here. This actually was one of the first PC sound cards. It came out in 1989, just about exactly 30 years ago. And it was a lot better, significantly better, than all the other sound cards on the market at the time. Uh, so this is what it looks like. This is just some random picture that I found on the internet. I actually don't own one of these cards. But uh, you can see it's a fairly simple card. You've got a bunch of DIP ICs on it, and there's an 8-bit ISA bus connector on there. So some of you might be asking, why bother cloning a really crappy 90s sound card? And I'll show you the reason why. This is eBay from a couple months ago. These cards are seriously selling for this much money. These are not just buy it now prices or whatever. People are paying legitimate money for these old sound cards, presumably to plug into some old 386 to play Commander Keen or whatever. Uh, this is the Game Blaster. So this is another variant of the sound card that's uh, slightly older and a little bit more rare. $400? Okay, now we're talking some serious money. This is a reason why I don't actually own one of these cards. So I want to chat a little bit about reverse engineering a PCB, like a printed circuit board. The most common method is a visual inspection. You basically look at the board, look at the traces, and then start a little notebook, start drawing a schematic, and you can kind of figure out what's connected to what. Uh, this only works with one or two layer boards, any more layers than that, and they're buried inside the board. You can't get at them, you can't see them anymore. So what you do with that is a strong light, and I've successfully used this on some four layer boards. Now you can't always do this because what happens is that the uh, copper structures will actually block your view. And so depending on where you are on the board, uh, how many copper pores are on the board, you can't always get at that copper underneath. Uh, you can also ohm out the board which takes a really long time. On a board like this, it's possible because you can actually access all the pins of all the devices. On a modern board, that's not necessarily true, especially if you have BGA components that have ball connections that are underneath the chip. And if you've got money or access to a very curious dentist, you can also x-ray the boards and see all the traces, including those underneath parts, which is great. Uh, if you're clever, you tilt this at an angle, and you can actually see the via structures and figure out what layers the traces are coming out on, which is great. Now, if you've got lots of money or access to a really expensive facility, you can use a 3D X-ray CT. And so this is a computed topo uh, topography system that will uh, give you a three-dimensional sort of uh, a volumetric pixel view of the entire board, and you can chop it up any way you want. Uh, so most obvious way is to go by layer, and so you can pick out all the different layers of the PC board. And I've successfully used this to reverse engineer six layer PC boards. Uh, another way is to sand it down. So you take the board, you take sandpaper, and you sand on it, and you turn it into dust. But you take pictures every time you run into a layer of copper. Uh, I did not put a picture in here because I don't like the toxic dust. I'm not going to go out and do it myself. If you want more information about that, uh, Joe Grant actually has some really excellent materials on his website going into the details and the pros and cons of all of these approaches, which is really interesting because I can't actually use any of these approaches because I don't have a card. All I have are these two high-resolution reference photos that I found on the Internet of the Sound Blaster card. That's it. So I started looking at the pictures, and I realized that... There's something in here that is not really going to help me much, which is this little chip here. All the rest of the chips on the board are off-the-shelf TTL logic or just really easy-to-get analog chips, with this one exception. And this has a Creative Labs marking on it. So you might think, well, is this a custom ASIC? And that's what I thought at first. And then I realized that there's an Intel copyright right there on the chip. There's also a 12 megahertz crystal, so this is starting to sound a little bit familiar. I did a little more research, and it turns out it's just an Intel 8051. So you might be asking, well, why don't you go and dump it? I'd like to remind you that I do not have a physical card. So where am I going to go and find a chip like this? And the answer is China. If you go on utsource.com, they are selling a custom mask ROM microprocessor meant for a Creative Lab sound card from 1991 in this case. So this is a slightly newer version than the one on the Sound Blaster 1.0. But stop and think about this for a little bit. So UT Source, they're claiming to sell a part that was only ever used on this sound card 30 years ago 
And where did they find these cards or these chips? Who are they selling them to? What's the business model here? I think maybe they put these parts up on their website literally just for me. So anyway, I ordered some. And this is what I got. So these are chips. They're in a slightly different package because the newer card went to surface mount instead of through hole. Uh, at first, I thought it was black topped. Uh, looking back, it probably is not black topped. It was just laser marked by the manufacturer at the time. The uh, joke with the Chinese manufacturer, or sorry, with the uh, Chinese brokers, is that you can order whatever part number you want, but please allow two to four weeks for them to laser mark it before they send it to you. And so the question is, well, can I dump it? So here's my dumping rig. It's just a parallel port programmer with a very old <laughs> Dell laptop. And this is what I got. So it's all FFs. What this means is that the data outputs on the bus are simply pulled up. They're not actually driving data out onto the bus. This is not great. Uh, okay, well, let's just, let's just say, you know what? Okay, I'm just going to push forward and deal with that problem later. And so now the next step is to reverse engineer the layout. So the bottom layer is pretty easy. I pull it into the uh, GIMP, which is the free image editing program. And I just draw over it. So I create a new layer and I start drawing traces, figuring out where they all go. Uh, incidentally, what I've, what, what I've got going on here with the colors is the stuff in yellow. These are traces that I've actually transferred to my schematic capture program. The blue is stuff that I haven't done yet. And so I can use that as a marker so I understand what traces I reverse engineered yet and which ones I haven't done yet. On the top layer, I ran into a problem, which is that there are chips in the way. If I had a physical car, this wouldn't be a problem because I could just desolder the chips and look underneath them. So what I did is I crowdsourced it. I went on Twitter and I said, hey guys, do you have an old car that you could send to me? And nobody had that, but one gentleman agreed to remove the chips on his working vintage Sound Blaster card and send me pictures so I could look underneath them. Uh, this is what it looked like on his workbench here. I, I would not have done this, but he had a whole professional desoldering setup. He was very confident and very excited in the project. And so here we are. This is the entire card reverse engineered in the sense that I've drawn all the traces out and uh, both on the top and the bottom, which is awesome. Uh, next step is to start figuring out what the parts are. And this is where I ran into another snag, which is these are really awful JPEG compressed images and JPEG reduces the color resolution, which means it's really hard to figure out resistor color codes. And so I went back to Twitter and the same guy that did all the desoldering work was able to send me some pictures of the resistors and so I could figure out what their values were. And so the next step that I do is I take the schematic, uh, so this is KiCad, and I just start dropping components in. So this is every single component that's on the circuit board. Uh, next step is to start wiring them up. So following the images that I captured in uh, the GIMP, I just start putting in one wire at a time, marking it off as I complete it. And so you can see here is some more progress here. I start moving functional blocks around. Uh, this is very close to the final schematic. And this is the final schematic here. I like to organize things by functional blocks. Inputs on the left, outputs on the right. So it's all neat, nice and organized. Uh, the line down the middle, if you're curious, that's actually the main data bus. And so that comes off the ISA card. It goes through some bus buffers into the synthesizer chips and also the uh, 8051 microcontroller. So the next step is to go to layout. And uh, what I do for layout is I set up a grid in GIMP. Because I have these reference images, I, I know that the chips have a 0.1 inch lead spacing. And so based on that, I can figure out the exact dots per inch of the image. And then I set up a grid on a 0.1 inch center. And I can look at that and start to figure out how they did the original layout because they're all going to line it to a grid. It's just a matter of figuring out what that grid is. And then I just copy it over. So this is KiCad. Uh, there's another program called DipTrace that apparently allows you to actually take an image and put it underneath your layout. And so that would have made things a lot easier if I could just trace on top of the image directly. But that's okay. So I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, here we are with the layout mostly completed. I can compare it with the original by copying the image, putting it on top of the GIMP image with transparency turned on. And then if anything is wrong, like if a trace is out of place, I'll see it immediately. And this one lines up, which is great. And so here we are. Here's a 3D rendering of the completed card. And I'm at the point where I might want to start spending money on this. And so now we're getting back to the original problem of this uh, 8051 microcontroller. So we're at a secret laboratory. This is actually uh, John McMaster's house. And <laughs> so we, 
we used uh, acid to remove the lid off the chip and confirm that, yes, indeed, it is an Intel ADC51, which is great because that means that we can look at the ROM and figure out the bits. Unfortunately for us, it's an implant ROM, which means that you cannot visually tell the difference between a 1 or a 0 using optical inspection. So, just at that same time, my friend Al came to me and he said, well, hey, I've got an old Sound Blaster card. Do you want it? And I said, yes. And then I looked at it and I realized it was a Chinese clone of the sound card from back in the day. And it's got a microcontroller on it that looks awfully similar to the one that the Sound Blaster card uses. I wonder if I can dump that one. So it turns out I can because they failed to set their code protect bit. Now that I have the code, uh, I have a couple of options for reverse engineering the firmware. Uh, Ida Pro, which is nice if you've got some money. Then there's Radar, which is uh, difficult to use. And I ended up with a little program called D52, which is some random guy on the internet who wrote an 8052 disassembler that's also 8051 compatible. And so the way that program works is that you run it the first time, and it generates a file called a control file. It basically tries to execute the code, figure out a code path, and identify what parts of the memory are code, what parts are data. Then what you do is you edit that control file as you learn more and more about the disassembled program. And you can make little corrections, and you just keep running it in an iterative process. And then eventually you can start adding things like labels and variable names and stuff like that. And so I learned some really interesting things about the code here, uh, doing it with this approach here. Uh, one of them is that it has uh, copy protection. So this is the end of an interrupt handler, and they're doing some stuff here. And then instead of a return from interrupt instruction, they have a copyright notice, which is really weird because you would think that you'd need a return instruction. And then I started thinking about it, and I realized that the ASCII number 2 happens to correspond to the RET-I instruction on this architecture. So yes, they are actually executing the copyright notice as part of their code. So that's kind of cute. Uh, another interesting bit of code here has to do with the way that the Sound Blaster digitizes audio. There is no analog to digital converter chip on this board because at the time they were very, very expensive devices. And so what Creative Labs did back in the day was they had an 8-bit DAC, a digital to analog converter, connected to a comparator. And basically, now you've got a comparator with an adjustable threshold. So you set it halfway, and you figure out if your incoming sample is above or below. And then using a process of successive approximation, you keep dividing the difference until now you have the exact value of that sample. And so it was a pretty common technique back in the day. Uh, nowadays, they still use it, but it's typically within the chip. So if you ever see a SAR ADC, that's how it works. And now that I have code, I can start ordering stuff from China. So I'm getting in some more chips here, including some of the synthesizer chips that the Sound Blaster uses to maintain compatibility with the uh, Game Blaster. Uh, these chips are actually fake. Uh, you can see on the comparison on the right-hand side here, I'm comparing it with uh, 7 4 series logic. If you scratch that with a knife, it turns white because of the glass fibers that are embedded inside the packaging. When you try to do that to a fake chip that's been uh, that's had its part number scraped off and replaced with paint that's then been laser marked, the paint will kind of peel up. So you hit it with a knife and you'll actually you can you could scrape off these little peelings and that's how you know that it's been remarked. Uh, to make a long story short, these chips actually worked fine. As far as I can tell, they are legitimate SAA 1099s that have been remarked to freshen up the date code. <laughs> so it sounds really silly, but a lot of contract manufacturers insist on having parts that are no older than three years, and it has to do with moisture absorption. So the packages will absorb moisture. When you run them through reflow, they can actually do what's called popcorning, where they explode like a kernel of popcorn and fly off the board. I've never seen it happen, but it must be impressive. So they freshen up date codes so they can sell old parts as new parts. Uh, so while I was waiting for boards to come, I also wrote a little test program. I fired up Turbo C. I don't know if any of you ever worked with uh, Turbo C before. And there we go. Uh, lost our video there for a bit. Turbo C is really fun. This is actually one of the most fun parts of this whole exercise. This is code that I've wanted to write for 25 years. I just never got around to it. Uh, then I got some sort of bad old memories came back to bite me like uh, far pointers. Have any of you ever dealt with far pointers before? I've, I see a few people that are sort of smiling and I can tell there's some Stockholm Syndrome going on there. For the rest of you who've never dealt with that, you're used to say like a 32 or 64-bit flat address space. 
in the old days, in the bad old days of the x86 architecture, you had a segment and an offset register. They're both 16-bit registers. To compute a physical address, you would take the offset register and add it to the segment register that's been shifted over by four bits to get a 20-bit physical address. So there's a couple of interesting things that spring out of that. So number one, you represent that with a 32-bit number in your program, but it means that you can have multiple 32-bit numbers that refer to the same physical address. Okay, so anyway, that's kind of a long story, but rough, right? Well, the other interesting thing that I ran into is the DMA controller for the x86 processor was originally designed for the Intel 8080. It only has 16 address lines, which means that you can only DMA up to 64K at a time. So what IBM did when they designed the PC was they added a 4-bit latch, and that would provide the extra 4 bits of address to get you a 20-bit address space. So the problem is, is that it means that you can, you still cannot transfer more than 64K at a time, but you also need to make sure that your memory is aligned to that page boundary. Otherwise, it will fail. It'll wrap around and start copying garbage. So the problem is, is that DOS will not let you allocate memory on a page boundary. And so I came up with this really complicated algorithm that would do a test allocation to see where it landed in the page and then allocate more memory and it would jump to the next page if necessary. And then I started looking at game code from back in the day. And you know what they do? They allocate memory. Does it cross the page boundary? Yes. Try again. Try as up to 16 times. If that fails, then exit to DOS with an error message. Okay, great. And boards came in. And I started soldering it up. This is a very exciting part because you really want to get it done. You want to try it out. But there's some soldering and some assembly required. And so here we are. Moment of truth. I have this plugged into an old IBM PC. And I'm turning it on and running that little test program that I wrote in Turbo C. And this is what I heard. Actually, yes, it was the literal ta-da.wave from Windows 3.1. In fact, let's see if this will play here. It works! So that was awesome. Now that's with a Chinese clone firmware, but I still have these chips that I ordered from China that seem to be the legitimate one. Will these chips actually work, or are they just fake? And so let's test one. So I took a socket, put it in the socket, put that socket adapter into another socket, which I put into a socket, which fit into the socket on the board. It looks ridiculous, but it worked. So I know these are legitimate chips. Okay, now that means that I got to reverse engineer that. I got to figure out a way to extract the firmware out of this device. And so I got some very high resolution imagery of the die, both the top metal layer and the polysilicon layer. And I started tracing out some circuitry. Uh, you can see I've got kind of some of the functional blocks uh, drawn out here. Program ROM is the interesting part. Uh, the other parts are kind of interesting too, like peripheral logic. I didn't dig into those at all. What I really wanted was low hanging fruit. I wanted to be able to look for something like a test mode. You know, I could kick it into test mode, maybe use that to read the ROM out. And so while I'm digging through, I figured I'd maybe talk a little bit about some of the elements that I found along the way. So this blurry mess here, this is actually a latch. And I can look at this and instantly recognize it as a latch because it's got these two interlocking pieces of metal. It's like two C-shapes that are kind of interlocking. But you haven't been staring at this for months, so you wouldn't know what that looks like. Let's dig into that a little bit. So this is the layer underneath. This is actually the uh, diffusion layer and the polysilicon layer. So the polysilicon layer is white. The diffusion layer is blue with sort of that black outline. Anytime polysilicon crosses diffusion, you get a transistor. And so you can see there's a couple of spots here. Here's a transistor here. Here's a transistor here. We've got one here, 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 and here. A couple of transistors. I'm going to redraw that with a top metal so it's a little easier to see in diagrammatic form. And so right here on this side, this is actually an inverter. And so there's two transistors in an inverter. There's a low, low side transistor and a high side transistor. Uh, the gates are connected together because they operate kind of as opposites of each other. When one transistor is on, the other one is off and vice versa. So there are, there's an inverter there. The latch itself is made of two inverters that are cross connected. And then there's another transistor that acts as a series switch. And so if you want to load data into this latch, you turn on that switch by asserting the load signal. And then your input basically forces those two inverters into a particular state. 
Yes, you are actually driving an output with an output in this case. And the way Intel designed it is they made that other inverter weak on purpose so that it's easy to overpower with your signal coming in. So that's how you latch the state of data. In fact, you would use this over a flip-flop because it requires far fewer transistors. And so they use these latches all over the place in the design. So let's zoom out a little bit. This is kind of a typical circuit here. Uh, if you were listening to Chris's presentation earlier, you could see that he was color coding his uh, power and ground rails. I've done the same thing here too, and it looks like we may have accidentally used the same color code, which is interesting. Uh, so you can also see there's a row of latches kind of in the middle here. So these guys right in here. And those are all part of the test mode circuit that I was trying to back out. Unfortunately, it turned out to be very, very complicated. And so I figured that uh, maybe I'd look into some approach that uh, you know could automatically extract a netlist or something. As it turns out, it's too complicated because the image just has too many shadows on it. So a chip is actually a 3D device. We're looking at it under a microscope, but there are shadows and things that, uh, that are basically three-dimensional shapes. So the polysilicon is bumpy, and when you put metal on top of that, you get these little bumps that cast shadows, and those look like dark lines, and so it's really hard to tell if it's an actual connection, or if it's just the shadow going underneath it, or if it's actually a completely disconnected piece of metal. And that's really unfortunate, so I had to go through by hand to figure this out. So this is part of what, the, what that circuit looks like. So I moved on from that, and I thought, well, maybe I should just start tracing out the ROM directly. So here's a little piece of the ROM. This is what I was able to figure out. There's a NAND array. It's uh, technically a NAND ROM in order to be uh, more compact. Uh, there's also an address mux here and a sense amplifier. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Uh, so a NAND ROM is interesting because what it's done is it's created a string of transistors like a string of Christmas lights all wired in series. And so if you break the circuit at any one of those points, it'll open the circuit and your output will go from a 1 to a 0. Uh, so in a NAND ROM, the way they do it is they have, uh, in, at least in this particular Intel chip, they have 64 columns that mux to a single output data bit. And then they have eight of those data bits going out to the data bus. And then there are 64 row inputs. So that's these guys here on the rows, A7 to A5. And those go all the way through the ROM. And so if you go and do the math, you end up with 4,096 bytes. So the way this ROM works is that it's an implant ROM. Each of those transistors in the branch has two possible configurations. One of them is a working transistor. The other is a transistor that is stuck on. And the way they do that is they use an ion implantation machine to take charge carriers and embed them underneath the transistor. And it actually shifts the threshold voltage of the transistor so there's no way to turn it off unless you apply a negative voltage, which you can't do on this chip. And so each of these row inputs is always going to be a 1, and if you want to read out a particular row, you simply assert it, you bring it low, and then if the transistor is broken, it stays on. If the transistor is not broken, it turns off, and so that's how you encode a 1 or a 0. And that's, again, that's done in the implant layer, and so unfortunately I cannot inspect that with an optical microscope. To compare that with another ROM that's on the chip, this is what the microcode ROM looks like. Uh, this is what's known as a diffusion ROM, and so that's all done in the uh, third diffusion layer here underneath polysilicon and metal. And uh, so the density of this is a lot less. They can't really fit quite as much data in here. Uh, in this case, it's fine because they're just using it to encode the microcode. And so optically, you can look at this and figure out what the bits are. So I'm going to go back to the sense amplifier on this ROM, and I notice some interesting things. It takes a signal coming from the ROM, it runs it through a buffer, it gates it with a clock signal, then it runs it into a latch. There is a single NOR gate that stands between the output of this ROM and the internal data bus in the 8051. That data bus goes to everything else in the chip, including the external data lines. So I could try to figure out how to assert that read line and read it out onto the bus, or, and I started thinking about this, because it turns out the 8051 supports an external program memory. What you do is you assert a wire that's called EA for external address, and it will put an address out onto the external bus lines to an external EEPROM that will then fetch a program word, feed that back in, and then it will execute it. So if I do that, and if I feed it no ops by forcing those data uh, inputs low, 
That means the program counter is now a literal counter. It's going to start at zero. It's going to count all the way up to 4,095, and then it's going to wrap back to the beginning. So if I'm doing that, then maybe there's a way I can probe the data bus outputs of that ROM directly. In fact, I would probe them right here, right before that gate. So I can take advantage of the sense amplifier and the rest of that circuitry. So what would that look like? Uh, so here we are at the secret lab, AKA John McMaster's house. And we've got the chip here in a socket with a very long ribbon cable. At the other end of this ribbon cable is the four megahertz oscillator. Yes, this works. No, I did not need load capacitors in that oscillator. There's a lot of parasitic capacitance along the way that serves that purpose. And then I've got a single tungsten probe coming in here to the decapped chip. And the first thing that I did is, uh, as a sort of a quick proof of concept, I went in to probe a convenient clock pad. And I think these were put in for some sort of, uh, not necessarily manufacturing test, but development test. Uh, these are two clock phases that are used in a whole bunch of registers and uh, functional circuitry throughout the chip. So what you do is you have to blow a hole through that protective oxide layer first. And uh, John's probe station conveniently has a laser installed just for that purpose. And in fact, his laser is a little old. It needs to have a new flash tube. And so it was a little like hitting a button, and sometimes nothing would happen. And sometimes it would blow a little tiny crater. And other times it would blow this giant gaping wound into the chip. So this was a very exciting process for me. So I was able to blow a hole in here and contact it with a tungsten probe. And this is what I got. Here's a clock signal. So this works. The ringing that you see on the signal is just because I had very long wires uh, involved in the test fixture and that tungsten probe. Uh, which, by the way, the tungsten probes look like this. They're finer than human hair. They go down to a point that's submicron. These things are really, really tiny. And that tungsten is actually soldered or uh, welded onto a soft wire that you can bend into different shapes. And so one of the art of uh, microprobing is being able to bend it to just the right angle. Because if it's too steep, then you can't see the probe tip under the microscope. If it's too shallow, then you're actually on the edge, not on the tip, and you can't get good contact with the circuit that you're trying to look at. And so here's an action shot of me trying to line up that tungsten probe uh, before I can see it under the microscope. Okay, here's the ROM output. It's circled. Here's the ROM output and I've blown a hole through the oxide layer. So you can see that little crater right there. So that's exposed metal. And I'm going to go in with the tungsten probe. And this is what I see. There is data there. I got very excited at this point, and I hooked it up to a Sele logic analyzer. And this is what I'm seeing here. So this is the counter, right? This is the program counter. These are the address pins coming off the chip. And right down here on the bottom, this is a data bit from that ROM. And I can tell it's legit because it goes high at the end because it runs out of program. It's just all FFs for the unused program memory. This is very promising. So all I got to do now is do this seven more times, which I did, and it was one of the more tedious three hours of my life. Now I had all this data, and I saved it out as a CSV file, and I wrote a really ugly and awful Python program that I will not be sharing that takes that and converts it into actual ROM data. Something is not right, though, because I took that ROM data, and I ran it through the disassembler, and none of it made any sense. I'm looking at it like there's instructions that just, you know, it, it's just it, it, clearly something went wrong. And so I figured, well, maybe I got the data out of order because clearly I can see FFs. So I know that th this is probably not encrypted. And so what I did is I ran a population count. I compared this to my reference 8051 program, which was the code coming out of the Chinese uh, Sound Blaster clone. And I noticed that the most common byte was FF, followed by 0x43, and on the Chinese sound card it was 0xc2. And then I realized that I just got the bit order reversed. So I went and I flipped that. And here we go, Copyright Creative Labs 1991. But does it work? Is it a good read? And so I took that code and I burned it into a modern 8051, put it in my sound card, and sure enough, it ran, and it made the ta-da.wave sound, which is fantastic. Uh, one thing I did notice from this reverse engineering effort, which is pretty interesting, is the, uh, well, actually, I'll get into that in a little bit. So next thing to do is to uh, disassemble it. So I'm using D52 again. 
and I found some interesting things. I found that there are seven previously unknown DSP commands. So I looked around on the internet, all the various literature. None of the stuff is documented. I also found a playback from SRAM mode that nobody ever used and was also never documented or explored. And so it allows you to download a sound into the SRAM of the 8051 and then play it back without using DMA. And then I found some bits and pieces of old code, including an ADPCM lookup table that they never ended up using. Uh, one of the other things that I found, uh, going back to this slide here, is there is a command that's undocumented that gives you the ROM checksum, which is this guy right here. So my first thought was, well, does this checksum match the checksum on an intact chip that's put in the same card? And the answer was, no, it was off by two. So that means that I've got some bits flipped in there somewhere, and I'll have to dig through that and see if I can figure out what's going on there. Oddly enough, I tried running the same checksum on the binary image on my computer, and it was yet a third value. It didn't match the other two values. So I clearly have some more work to do to figure out what's going on with that. Okay, so we got that. Uh, I think that's basically it. Oh yeah, um, you probably want me to talk about the secret 512-byte ROM that I found inside the Intel 8051, which happens to be in every Intel 80C51. I don't know what it does, but I kind of figured out a little bit about how that ROM works just by the address decoder. So I looked at the address decoder, and there is an enable bit that comes in, and it muxes the ROM between the 4K user ROM and this 512-byte, I'm going to call it a test ROM, like a test mode ROM. And I think they use that during manufacturing tests so they could kick this chip into a special mode and run their special program and exercise all these different functions of the chip. I don't know for sure, but one of these days I'm going to read that out and see what that is because it's very interesting. This is where it is on the chip. So basically I found it because I was counting the geometry of the ROM and I discovered that it did not add up to 4096. I must have counted it a dozen times, but it turns out it's just because it's got this extra 512 byte secret ROM in it. All right, to conclude, I published the design for this particular sound card and so people have been building clones of it. And uh, in fact, I saw one of these on eBay the other day. And so some guy in Russia is trying to sell one for $180. So that's been up there for months. <laughs> and he keeps relisting it for $20 cheaper every time. And it just has not sold. So we'll see what happens. Any questions? Someone's got to have a question. Yes? What's your next project from the 90s? <laughs> my next project from the 90s? Um, I don't know, but I, I'm kicking around the idea of building my own Vectrex. So that might be something to do. It's got more high voltage in it. Yes? I have a couple of questions. Do you have anything for Vectrex? Oh, Vectrexes. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, everyone's hoarding Vectrexes. It's kind of hilarious. Yeah, it's a great game. Great machine. Yes. Ooh, that's a really interesting idea. Uh, those are pretty expensive, but if I get my hands on one, then uh, I might make an attempt. They're very nice cards, though. No more questions okay. about 8051? No questions. No one's All ever right. written any code for the 8051? Yes. So have you ever looked at uh, old-style Bosch uh, car injection computers? I have not, but it sounds plausible they would use a microcontroller like that. They use uh, 8051 derivatives uh, with some extra I.O. stuff and also the internal ROM. And there is floating around somewhere in the internet a version of their internal code, but uh trying to reverse engineer that with the more modern ones it sometimes works and sometimes it doesn't so interesting might, yeah exactly you might make a whole bunch of old porsche owners really happy if you would uh <laughs> that's interesting because yeah. i think some of that has actually been reverse engineered before if it's a microcontroller made by philips uh there's actually a known uh, exploit where you use external address mode with an external eprom to basically dynamically manipulate the EA pin and then do a move X instruction or a move C instruction 
to grab the contents of the internal ROM and then send them out through the serial port. So there is a known method for extracting firmware from some of those devices. Yeah, it could be, but I'm, I'm, I think the way that I got a hold of that one copy and with, with, the, with the description that this was all the guy got... I don't think all of them have been done just yet. So. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, one of the uh, sort of side goals of this project is to figure out a quick and easy way to dump code out of any uh, protected uh, ADC51. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in that 512 byte test mode ROM. I think there may be something in there that will allow me to verify the contents of the user ROM uh, through some method. And uh, that may be a valuable uh, way to go. Yes? I haven't received any secret emails. Okay. But you tell them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would imagine they're all under NDA still. So I see the same thing about the uh, the Intel processor. I'm sure it's the test modes are well documented, but they're also closely held secrets. <laughs> Great. Since Thank we still you. have about 10 minutes, um, I actually had a couple of bonus slides in here if anyone's interested. Yeah. To do it? Yeah. Okay, this is this is pretty silly, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit. It's a lot of it is kind of a history lesson about uh, Creative Labs and the Sound Blaster card. I spend way too much way too much time on this. So it turns out all of these sound cards came out around the same time. Uh, so this is the AdLib sound card and a lot of old games supported it. This came out in October 1987. Uh, I actually went through a whole bunch of old computer magazines, like PC Magazine and stuff, and looked for advertising for once, and uh, found a, a lot of this sort of interesting advertising. Most of these sound cards were actually geared towards musicians and composers at the time, because, you know, people just didn't play that many games on the PC at that point. And if they did, the PC speaker was what kind of people expected. Uh, at the same time, uh, Creative Labs actually came out with their first card, which was their creative music system. So that came out in August of 1987, so literally months apart. And then uh, at some point, they figured out that people were buying these systems and not actually composing music on them. They were using them to play games. And so they re-released this as the Game Blaster and sold it through Radio Shack. Uh, they were both pretty expensive systems, and so what a lot of people did, instead of spending the you know $200 or whatever, is they would buy a Kovacs, which is basically a resistor ladder DAC that you'd connect to your parallel port. I actually built one of these back in the day so I could like, listen to my mod tracker music and stuff. And so you'd spend $70 and you just plug it in and it worked. Uh, there was a clone that was very similar of it called the uh, uh, Disney Sound Source. And some of you might have had that as well. Uh, so what happened then is Creative Labs was looking at the market and they realized that there was a real market need for uh, what they termed a killer card, something that supported both synthesizer music and digital playback, and they thought, well, since we're doing that, we should be able to make it record sound as well and support all of these other cards. And so they came out with this killer card here called the, uh, the Sound Blaster 1.0. So this particular picture was from a, uh, a magazine review edition that they mailed out to a bunch of magazines uh, for their uh, review editions. Uh, I think this is about summer of 1989 when this happened. This particular card recently sold on eBay for $6,000, if you can believe it to a private collector in uh, Australia. And uh, so here's what the article looks like. They basically go through and uh, they actually have a picture of the talking parrot. I don't know if any of you ever played with the talking parrot game at the time. It was, it was kind of fun. You basically, uh, you would talk to it through the microphone and then it would take everything that you said and speed it up twice at like a, by a factor of two and then play it back through the speakers. And then it would yell at you and swear. Well, not really swear. There was a, it was a clean program. Uh, so anyway, it was kind of fun to play with. Uh, they also started advertising really aggressively, and so this is probably one of the first Sound Blaster ads that came out. And they were selling the card for $240, but they offered a mail-in rebate. So if you had an old sound card, like your AdLib card that you bought two years ago, or a creative uh, uh, a music system card, or a Kovacs card, you could mail that back to them, and they would give you $100 credit. And then the also thing to remember is that the, this card included joystick functionality, and at the time, if you wanted to use a joystick, you had to buy a $40 card just for the joystick. And so combining all this functionality together was actually a really good value, and I think that's one of the reasons why it was such a successful thing. 
Uh, AdLib was having a really hard time. They were, they were trying to do the follow-on card, which was the AdLib Gold, which unfortunately never really went anywhere. And then uh, Creative Labs had already moved several revisions on up through the Sound Blaster Pro, which you could connect to a CD-ROM drive. Because at that point, PCs really had no way to connect to a CD-ROM drive other than through a dedicated card or through this uh, Sound Blaster card. And so anyway, I thought that would be kind of a fun little uh, history lesson for you guys. And if you're interested, I got one more bonus slide, which was the uh, AdLib card that I cloned. So that was another fun one. Uh, I also cloned that one from pictures because these cards are way too expensive for me to own. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you.